This is part one of a three-part series on Timoshenko Beam Theory. I've had a lot of requests for this video, and it's been a long time in the making, largely because I wanted to derive Timoshenko Beam Theory using the method of Hamilton's principle. Even though we could quite easily have derived it using Newton's law, much as the way we did for the Euler-Bernoulli beam, the reason I wanted to wait this long is so that at the time of the making of this video, we now have a framework which is along the lines of that that you should encounter when reading research papers on the topic. So we're going to move through this material in the way in which one might expect to see this in research papers, articles, or someone's dissertation. We'll start off by drawing our beam. I've drawn it as a cantilevered beam, just so we can visualize it. But really, I'm going to derive the equations for all general boundary conditions, of which the cantilevered beam would be one. Notice, however, that this beam is a lot stubbier, or less slender, shall we say, than what I've drawn before. Euler-Bernoulli beam theory tends to be good for long, slender beams. That is, beams whose length is much, much greater than its height. And Euler-Bernoulli beam theory starts to break down as the beams become much stubbier. We'll talk a little bit more about what is meant by this in a little while. And let's set up a coordinate system. The axial direction is x, and the displacement in that direction we'll call u. And then the transverse direction will be the z direction, and we'll call displacements in that direction w. As usual, we'll assume there's a general loading condition on the beam, which we'll call f. f is a function of both x and t. Now, Timoshenko beam theory was discovered or invented by Stephen Timoshenko. At least that's what the anglicized version of his name is. And Timoshenko lived from 1878 to 1972. So unlike many of the people we've been discussing in these videos, like Euler, Bernoulli, Newton, all of whom died several hundred years ago, Stephen Timoshenko is a much more recent figure. And we'll find out a little bit more about him in a second. But up to this point, the prevailing beam theory at the time was the Euler-Bernoulli theory. And the Euler-Bernoulli theory was discovered in approximately 1750. So we're talking about a theory that was 120 years old, even by the time of Timoshenko's birth. Timoshenko beam theory was actually discovered jointly by Timoshenko and an Austrian physicist named Paul Ehrenfest. And for some reason, in the literature, Ehrenfest's name routinely gets left off the theory, and it's almost exclusively referred to as Timoshenko beam theory. Though even by Timoshenko's own admission, Ehrenfest had played an important role in the discovery. The date at which the timoshenko Ehrenfest theory came about is somewhat under debate. Timoshenko first mentioned the theory in a textbook he wrote in 1916, but it was only a few years later in 1921 that this theory was actually published in a paper and at which time it became far more widely known. Consequently, Timoshenko beam theory is a much newer theory than Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, and as such, Timoshenko beam theory is considered to be an improved or more accurate theory. Before we go any further, you guys seem to have found my history lessons to be quite popular, so I thought I'd give you another little history lesson here, this time in the name of Stephen Timoshenko. Stephen Timoshenko was born in Ukraine in 1978, and back in those days, Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. Between 1918 and 1920, he helped establish the Ukrainian Academy of Science and headed up the Institute of Mechanics, which today carries his name. In 1922, right around the time that the Soviet Union was forming, he immigrated to the United States and began working at Westinghouse. Then, in 1927, Timoshenko became a faculty professor at the University of Michigan, where he created the first bachelor's and doctoral programs in engineering mechanics. I mean, this was a pretty big deal, right? Many of you watching this, I'm sure, are direct beneficiaries of that. In 1936, he became a professor at Stanford University. In 1939, was elected to the American Philosophical Society and a year later in 1940 was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. In 1957, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers established the Timoshenko Medal, which honors Stephen Timoshenko as the world-renowned authority 
in the field of mechanical engineering, and he became the first recipient. To be clear, Stephen Timoshenko, in his time, was considered to be the world's greatest mechanical engineer, and is considered to be the father of modern engineering mechanics. Indeed, Timoshenko's textbooks, of which there are several, have been published in 36 languages. Just consider that for a minute. Can you even name 36 languages? There's not a country in the world where mechanical engineers do not know the name Stephen Timoshenko. Timoshenko eventually died in 1972 at the age of 93. And as a result, some of you who are viewing, your existence overlapped with Timoshenko's. In continuing the history lesson, we're now going to shift our attention from Timoshenko to the beam theory timeline. Historians now claim that Leonardo da Vinci, who lived from 1452 to 1519, that he was the first one to attempt the development of a beam theory. Then roughly a hundred years later, another Italian, this time Galileo Galilei, also attempted to develop a beam theory. But both Leonardo and Galileo lacked two important ingredients that were going to be necessary to develop it. The first was discovered in 1616 called Hooke's Law, which related the stresses in a material to its strains. And then, of course, the invention of calculus by Newton and Leibniz. Thereafter, it was Jacob Bernoulli who made many observations to do with the development of the beam model. But it wasn't until Leonard Euler and Daniel Bernoulli published their work that Euler-Bernoulli beam theory was discovered. It should be mentioned that the Bernoulli in the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory was not named after Daniel Bernoulli, who helped Euler publish the theory, but rather after Daniel's uncle, Jacob Bernoulli. Also of interest is both Euler and Daniel Bernoulli were PhD students of Johann Bernoulli. And Johann Bernoulli, of course, was the brother of Jacob Bernoulli, and also the father of Daniel Bernoulli. So while it is named after Jacob Bernoulli, it was in fact Daniel Bernoulli who published the theory along with Euler. Well, it lay dormant for quite some time, but then a hundred or so years later, it really began finding its place in engineering. In 1989, the World's Fair was held in Paris, France, and in its honor, the Eiffel Tower was constructed. And to be clear, the Eiffel Tower used Euler-Bernoulli beam theory extensively in its design. For those of you who don't know, the Eiffel Tower at the time that it was built was the tallest structure in the world at 984 feet. It was the first structure to pass 200 meters in height and the first structure to reach 300 meters in height. Later, an antenna got added to the top of it, which further increased the height to 1,083 feet. And what did the Eiffel Tower surpass as the world's tallest structure? What was the previous world's tallest structure? That title went to the Washington Monument, which was 555 feet or 169 meters tall. So Euler-Bernoulli beam theory allowed architectural design to reach heights of almost double what had been reached before. And then in 1893, another application of the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory resulted in the design of the Ferris wheel. The Ferris wheel was built for the World's Columbian Expo in Chicago, Illinois. While wheels like this did exist prior to the Ferris wheel, these wheels were called pleasure wheels and were much, much smaller. These wooden pleasure wheels at the time were at most 50 feet in diameter, but the Ferris wheel was 254 feet in diameter, which meant it dwarfed any of the wooden pleasure wheels of its time. Anyway, for about the next 40 years, the Eiffel Tower continued to be the tallest structure in the world. Then, as we mentioned, in 1916 to 1921, Timoshenko published his beam theory. And this was the first time beam theory was advanced since the Euler-Bernoulli theory. And what stole the Eiffel Tower's title as the tallest building in the world? Well, in 1930, the Chrysler Building in New York was opened, and that was slightly taller than the Eiffel Tower. Although then the Eiffel Tower added an antenna, and briefly it once again became the tallest structure in the world. This until the following year, when in 1931, the Empire State Building in New York was opened. The Empire State Building had a height of 1,250 feet, or 380 meters, and for once and for all, put an end to the Eiffel Tower's title 
as the world's tallest structure. The Empire State, mind you, has an antenna on top which further extends its height to 1,454 feet. Now, while the Empire State Building was built after the advancement of Timoshenko Beam Theory, Timoshenko Beam Theory in 1931 was still relatively new and largely untested and largely unproven in the real world. And so it's reasonable to assume that Timoshenko Beam Theory was not used very much, if at all, in the design of the Empire State Building. So as of 1921, we have two competing beam theories. On the one hand, we have Euler Bernoulli, and on the other hand, we have Timoshenko or Timoshenko Ehrenfest. The Euler Bernoulli assumption is good for slender beams. These are beams whose aspect ratio is greater than, say, 6. The, the aspect ratio being loosely defined as the length divided by the height. Whereas the Timoshenko beam theory must be used for aspect ratios of less than about four, so for short stubby beams. Now, this is not to say that you cannot use the Timoshenko beam theory for slender beams. You can always use the Timoshenko beam theory, but in the case of very slender beams, the Euler Bernoulli theory is plenty accurate and simpler. Another difference between the two theories is that in Euler Bernoulli beam theory, one of the main assumptions is that after deformation, the cross-sections of the beam remain planar and perpendicular to the elastic axis. In the case of Timoshenko beam theory, however, we include shear effects. As a result of the shear effects, the cross-sections no longer remain perpendicular to the elastic axis after deformation. However, the cross-sections still remain planar, as in the case of the Euler-Bernoulli beam. So both cross-sections remain planar, but only in the case of the Euler-Bernoulli beam do the cross-sections remain normal to the elastic axis. And then in the case of the Euler-Bernoulli beam, we ignored rotary kinetic energy effects, which we were told were insignificant in the case of slender beams, whereas in the case of the Timoshenko beam, the rotatory kinetic energy is included. And then finally, the Euler-Bernoulli theory may be used only on isotropic beams, whereas the Timoshenko beam theory can be used on isotropic or anisotropic beams. This means when dealing with composite type materials, one must use a Timoshenko beam theory. Modeling shear. Let's just copy our figure here, and let's assume that our beam is a rectangular shape from the side view, in which case, let me just draw a rectangle here. I've drawn the center line showing that it's perpendicular to the cross sections. This is in its undeformed state. Now, if we take this rectangular shape, there are really two different ways in which we can apply a shear deformation to it. The first is to keep the top and bottom surfaces horizontal and to slide the top surface to the left and the bottom surface to the right. When we do that, we end up with a shape that looks like this where the horizontal surfaces remain horizontal and the vertical surfaces or cross sections have rotated. Alternatively, we could shear it by keeping the sides parallel to one another and let's say shifting this right hand side up and shifting the left hand side down. If we do that, we end up with a shape that looks like this, where the vertical surfaces or cross sections remain vertical and the top and bottom surfaces and the center line have now rotated. In the first case, we will look at the rotation of the cross sections from the vertical. We call this gamma, and gamma is a function of x. Similarly, in the second case, we look at the horizontal surfaces and we see how they've rotated with respect to the horizontal. And in this case, the rotation with respect to the horizontal is given the angle gamma. And if we're being even more precise about it, gamma xz. And gamma in general is a function of x. In fact, it's a function of x and z, but we'll address that later. For now, we'll just assume that gamma is a function of x only. And gamma, of course, is known as the shear angle. So of these two models for describing shear, we're going to take the second model. In other words, we will assume that as a result of a shear strain, the center line will rotate, but the cross sections will not rotate. Let me repeat that. As a result of the shear strain or the shear angle, the center line will rotate, 
but the cross sections will not rotate. So let's just try to sketch a figure of this. If we take our beam over here and we apply a pure shear deformation to it, the black figure represents the underformed beam, while the red figure shows the beam after deformation. Notice that the cross sections remain vertical and the center line rotates. Also notice that the angle of the center line with respect to the horizontal is a function of x. So the shear angle over here is not the same as the shear angle over there. That should be fairly obvious from the figure. So if we take the center line at any point, we find that in general it makes an angle with the horizontal. In this case, we might be looking at this section over here where that is the tangent and that is the cross section. And this is what I've blown up over here. So the angle between the center line and the horizontal, that's just gamma. Okay, that's for shear deformations. And for completeness, let's also have a look at the bending deformation. This, of course, is the Euler-Bernoulli assumption, which we've seen many times before. And in this case, the center line also rotates as a result of bending. But the difference is, is that in the case of bending, the Euler-Bernoulli assumption still holds. And that is that the cross sections remain plain and normal to the center line after deformation. So the top one is shear deformation, and the bottom one is bending deformation, or the Euler-Bernoulli assumption. In the case of shear deformation, the center line moves by the shear angle, but the cross sections do not rotate. On the other hand, due to the bending deformation of the beam, if we again take a representative cross section like over there and zoom up on it, that we find that the center line has rotated with respect to the horizontal. We'll call this rotation psi of x. However, in this case, the cross section has rotated by the same amount, which is why the cross section will remain normal to the center line or the elastic axis. So to be clear, the model before only used the Euler-Bernoulli assumption. This current model is going to use the Euler-Bernoulli assumption and add shear deformation to that. Consequently, the Timoshenko beam model is really just an extension of the Euler-Bernoulli beam model. The Timoshenko model incorporates everything that the Euler-Bernoulli model incorporates and more. Why? Because it incorporates shear deformation and it also incorporates the effects of rotatory inertia. This is to say that the center line rotates because of two separate effects. The first is it rotates due to the shearing of the beam, and the second is it rotates due to the bending of the beam. The amount of rotation due to the shearing of the beam we call gamma, or the shear angle, and the amount of rotation due to the bending of the beam we call psi, or the bending angle. And like gamma, psi too is a function of x. So again, when considering the basic difference between these two effects, the shearing and the bending, in the case of shearing, the cross section does not rotate. And in the case of bending, the cross section does rotate by an amount psi. In both cases, the center line rotates. Now again, this is consistent with using the second model. Had we instead used this first model, and I mention this only because some explanations do use that. Well, if we looked at the first model, it would only cause a rotation of the cross section and not a rotation of the center line. And in that case, the rotation of the center line would be due to bending alone. But again, we are not going to use this version of the model, but we're going to use this one instead. So shearing causes only a rotation of the center line and the horizontal surfaces but it causes no rotation of the cross section under this model. And let's just put that in there. So the shear causes no rotation of the cross section, and as a result, there's bending rotation of the cross section only. I want to keep the figures for our reference. So let me just clear some space here. And so based on our discussions this far, let's write down some assumptions. The first is our typical assumption of a homogeneous isotropic prismatic beam. Now, Timoshenko beam theory is valid for anisotropic beams and non-prismatic beams too. So when I make the assumption later in the derivation, I'll be sure to point it out. But until that point, there is no loss of generality.
So initially we'll assume that actually we haven't applied assumption one, and everything we say is in fact valid for non-homogeneous or anisotropic or non-prismatic beams, or all of the above. The second assumption is that the cross sections move vertically due to shear, but they do not rotate, and we've already discussed that. The third assumption is that line segments tangent to the center line are rotated by the shear angle gamma, where gamma, as we said, is a function of x it equals gamma xz. It's the shear strain of the x face in the z direction, or equivalently, it's the strain of the z face in the x direction. Let me make the point here that this angle is initially assumed to be the shear angle along the center line. Okay, now if I draw the cross section of the beam, something like this, and let me give it some coordinates, y and z, and some dimensions. In the y direction, the thickness is b, and in the z direction, the height is h. And let's give it our force. I'll do it in green since we're using red for something else, but our force is f, uh, f of x, really f of x and t. Now, along the center of the line, we've said that the shear angle is called gamma, or gamma of x. And now we're going to make one more assumption. And that is, we are going to assume that the shear angle, the shear strain gamma, is the same at all points across the cross section. So at the top, the shear angle is gamma, and at the bottom, the shear angle is gamma, and everywhere in between on that cross section, the shear angle is gamma, which is the same as the shear angle of the center line. So let me be clear with what I'm saying. In reality, Gamma is actually a function of both x and z. How do we know this? Well, for starters, if we look at the loading condition of our beam, we see that there is no load at all on the bottom surface, and there's no shear load at all on the top surface, just a normal load. So it's really physically impossible that our shear angle should be gamma the whole way across the cross section. Because if there's no shear force on the top or the bottom surface, then the shear angle is really going to be zero at these points. And if you're thinking to yourself, hey, that sounds like it probably has a parabolic shape, you'd in fact be correct. For a beam with a rectangular cross-section, the shear would in fact be parabolic and not constant. So assumption four is the assumption of uniform shear angle across the cross-section. And I'm just going to plant a flag here where we can all see it for now. This is an impossible situation. Turns out it's a very good assumption to make for now because it makes the problem tractable. And it's something we will correct later. So I've planted this flag here, this impossible flag where we can all see it. It dramatically simplifies things at this stage of the analysis. And we will correct for that assumption later. Okay, now I'm going to cut the first video at this point. There's not too much to review. If all that you have gotten out of this video are these four assumptions, assuming you understand them, then you're just fine. In the next video, part two, we're going to do some math, and we'll derive expressions for the strain energy, the kinetic energy, the external work, as well as their variations, so that we can substitute them into Hamilton's principle. Anyway, thank you for watching this. I hope you have found something useful in it. If you have and you'd like to support this channel, there are several ways you can do that. The first is to go ahead and smash that like button. This helps to get this video in front of others like you who might enjoy it. The second is to click subscribe and click on the bell icon. This way you'll be notified of all future video releases. And as always, the class notes are available for download. If you have any questions, complaints, or criticisms, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.